Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor Thomas Goss with one last video for the year 2015 and the inauguration of a monthly series of orchestration lessons. Please stay with me until the end of the video for a special holiday message. About two and a half years ago, when I uploaded the first two Lily Boulanger orchestration lessons, I promised that if another of her full orchestral scores were added to the imslp.org website, then I'd continue the series. This year, I came by a PDF of one such work and uploaded it to IMSLP myself, and it's one of her greatest scores, the Psalm 130 De Profundis. It truly deserves a place among the great choral orchestral works of the 20th century, such as Stravinsky's Symphony of Psalms, Orff's Carmina Burana, and Britain's War Requiem. Although it's half the length of any of those better-known works, bar by bar it equals them in scope and inspiration. This large-scale work was one of several that Boulanger started in 1914 as a newly arrived resident of the Villa Medici in Rome. These were difficult times for her. The 1913 victory of winning the Prix de Rome had forced her to make endless social calls and concert appearances. The strain this put on her delicate health caused a complete breakdown by the end of that year. In early 1914, she delayed her departure for Italy for as long as she possibly could, then made her way limpingly to Rome, with extended stops along the way to convalesce. When she finally arrived, she found a hostile atmosphere. The villa's director, the painter Albert Bénard, had turned against her, resentful of her gender, unsympathetic to the delays, and contemptuous of her need for both her maid and her mother to attend her. Nevertheless, Lily made the best of it, and in the heady atmosphere of artistic and intellectual stimulation, her imagination took flight in the conception of a series of great works. This piece, the Psalm 130 De Profundis for Chorus, Organ, and Orchestra, is her masterpiece of that form. Its dedication is just as significant as its subject, to the memory of my dear papa. Her father, the opera composer Ernest Boulanger, had also won the Prix de Rome in his youth. For the very reason that her own life expectancy was limited, she had set the goal of giving every ounce of strength left in her to the pursuit of a career as a composer in the family trade. Having reached the pinnacle of that effort, she was now honoring the iconic figure of her father with the heights of her inspiration. And yet the subject of the Psalm 130 was more of a meditation on her own desperate, uncertain condition, and her strong faith that she turned to for solace. As she did throughout her career, her will to live and sorrow over her condition were turned outward into a world-embracing act of artistic empathy, void of any indulgent self-pity. Let's start our analysis of the Psalm 130 by looking at the building blocks she introduces in the prologue. This lesson is about orchestration, not music theory, so I'll quickly cover some of the structure and planning that Lily reveals from the start. This striking chord recurs throughout the piece. A first inversion major triad with an added sharp 11. This gives the harmony not only a Lydian quality with the implication of a raised fourth, but also the naked dissonance at the top interval of the chord. The sharp 11 acts as a springboard in some cases to additive harmony, such as the rising motive that starts as a C-flat 6-3 chord, adds a B-flat 6-3 chord, and ends at the top of an F-sharp minor 6-4 chord. There are many other novel harmonic structures in the piece. 
I love the septatonic mode that she uses at the crux of the violin episode between figures one and two. And the juxtaposition of two separate chords in the following bar. G major 7 plus 5 against a G flat minor 6 3 chord with a sharp 9. This forces the relationship of the intervals into an unusual and striking progression. There are four motives to watch for, which start out as the merest hint of melody in some cases, and gradually build in importance and meaning as the piece evolves. The first seems like nothing special, a mere handful of slower notes, but they contain the germ of epiphany within them. There's something of an inversion of the third bar, a tiny musical sob of four notes, that also appears sparsely in the prologue. The second motive we've already discussed, the rising arpeggio that crosses registers and additive harmonies. The third is a varying pattern, a downward jump of a third or a fourth, followed by two more notes, sometimes descending seconds, sometimes ascending thirds. Lili plays the two against each other in the aforementioned section for violin soli. The fourth is a rising motive in which each higher pitch is ascended to from below by a third. This is echoed somewhat in an accompaniment figure, a rising series of downward driving chromatic notes. Now let's see how Lili puts all these elements to work in the score. First though, I recommend that you put on a pair of headphones, because some elements just don't translate through computer speakers, especially the opening two bars. From the start, we hear the evidence of Lili's remarkable ear as a composer. Pianissimo bass drum rolled with timpani sticks, doubling an organ trill inside a diminished chord. That immediately sets the stage for a sense of vast depth, with a throbbing drone that expands the ears. Over this, the first statement of main motive, with solo tuba doubling solo cello. Most recordings don't balance these two unlikely partners very well, even with the tuba marked down one degree. But listen to this excerpt from the Nadia Boulanger recording with the BBC Symphony Orchestra and Chorus. The two soloists merge with dark, husky unity, almost a choking sound. As the passage comes to an end, Watch out for that resolving chord of C-flat 6-3 sharp 11, a chord we'll get to know well over the course of the piece. Let's look at the way that last chord is scored. Extremely low horns in old notation, sounding a fourth higher rather than a fifth lower in bass clef. Doubling organ. The organ's low E flat is doubled at the octave by a timpani roll. This puts a low major second interval at the bottom of the chord, with the fourth horn and tuba doubling on concert F against this E flat. Once again, complex overtones produce psychoacoustic effects in the ear of the listener. The rising motive with additive harmony dovetails out of this acoustic wash. 
solo bass and cello, doubled by solo sarusophone. Pretty much every recording out there uses a contrabassoon instead of sarusophone, which is much easier to get a hold of and to blend in moments like this. Over that high G flat, muted upper strings play first and second desks for an intimate, haunting sound. Then the opening motive returns in doubled octave cellos, thickened by solo trombone and the return of the tuba. Once again, the rising motive follows the sharp 11 chord. Solo contrabassoon and double bass start the line, but unison cellos join with dovetailing first horn. Lili plays with the texture, but for no arbitrary reason. The radiance of that top unison concert A lights up the harmony of the wind section passage, as it's the major 7 of a B-flat minor major 7 chord. Here's the first occurrence of that little inverted sob in first oboe and flute. I've already discussed the unusual modality of the central bar of the violin soli passage. That type of searching, passionate, and tonally ambiguous scoring was explored by many composers after Lili. For example, Bartok and Shostakovich, and highly imitated in film scoring. Here it sounds fresh and compelling. I love the way the passage ends, and a fiery sharp nine against the stomping E-flat and Pitt's basses, organ and timpani. bars before figure two, first and second trumpets introduce the zigzagging fourth motive, but just as a setup for the modulation to F-sharp minor. From there, we see this motive developed somewhat in the aforementioned accompaniment figure, but with her usual genius, Lili explores the contrapuntal possibilities, even in the basso profundo register. It's an audacious idea, all the more effective as the opposing textures make the overlapping lines intelligible. Lower strings against horns doubled by stabilizing bassoons. Listen to how this passage gains in power and momentum over the trilling and tremolo F-sharps and violas, alternating clarinets and bass clarinet. Page 6, I recommend you study the score yourself up to the entrance of the chorus at figure 4 on page 11. First play through the organ part, paying attention to the exquisite harmony and how it supports and fills in the texture so that the rest of the orchestra may function more contrapuntally. Don't leave out the bottom pedal notes. Then read through or play through the brass section, watching for how the upper players carry the theme and how the lower players support it by doubling the organ at times. Please note that because of poor miking in nearly every recording of this work, the upper winds are almost inaudible from pages 7 to 9 of the Durand edition. It's a shame because that sound would elevate this texture to transcendence if it were just balanced correctly, an effort that no conductor or producer seems willing to do, even Nadia Boulanger. Despite all that, 
Listen for the lovely and yet terrifying way Lili brings all the elements together, cranking up that tension unbearably until the release that starts at the end of page 9. The orchestral sound here is like no other composer I've heard. Richly and unreservedly emotional, and yet with superb, generous intelligence. There's a lesson on every page, even for a professional orchestrator at the height of their craft. So that was my first look at Lili Boulanger's remarkable score, Psalm 130 De Profundis. I plan to return to the subject over the following months because we barely uncovered all the inspiration and craft that she put into this masterpiece. I'd like to finish now with a message for all aspiring orchestral composers out there. First, thanks so much for showing me how passionate you are about the work that we all do. Some of you are just starting, some of you are establishing your careers and some are professionals, but all of you really care about this craft. When you share a useful perspective, or make a constructive comment on a score, or link some indispensable information, you help to make this first generation of internet composers stronger. I've seen composers here in the community start from nothing but enthusiasm, and go on to earn a composition degree. I've seen graduates and DIY composers get serious about their orchestration, and start scoring professionally. And I've seen professionals get a real kick out of helping the process along while learning quite a few things as well. And that includes me. I learn something new every day. And thank goodness that I don't know everything. What a boring life that would be. Thank you all for your patience and enthusiasm. I really couldn't have done it without your feedback and support. I hope to bring you ever more training and resources in the coming year with more videos, orchestration reviews, and ultimately a massive online open course in orchestration, if the momentum builds. So here's to you, orchestrators. All the best of the season, and the happiest and most productive new year to come. If you're watching this on Facebook or YouTube, please let me know in a comment below how you grew artistically this year and what your plans are. I'd love to read about it and look forward to seeing how things go for you in 2016.